Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. Alleluia. These are some of the very first words that we have from the earliest Easter worship. Thousands of years old, and yet what power, what mystery, what wonder they still hold for us on this Easter morning. Easter began in the dark. We celebrate with lights and white and gold and colors and shine and sparkle and volume and brightness, but Easter began in the dark. Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. The sky was dark, the footpath was dark, the horizon showed no signs of the coming sun yet. Maybe she walked with an oil lamp. She must have had something to show her the way. Maybe the moonlight was enough, the starlight from above. But somehow, as she approached the tomb, there was just enough light to see that the stone covering the entrance had been rolled away. How startling, how frightening, even, standing alone in the dark before dawn, staring into the cavern of an open tomb. But even before that, Even before Mary's pre-dawn pilgrimage began, maybe hours before, maybe moments before, maybe millennia before, Easter was already in motion. In an even deeper darkness, an even holier hush. In the silence and the sealed up stone of the hillside, the unseen impossibility took hold, took shape, took breath. It happened where no one could see. Easter began in the darkest of dark. What was dead, Mary expected to find dead. What was sealed, Mary expected to find sealed. We do not expect anything of death other than death. We do not ask anything of a tomb except to hold what is dead. A quiet, cool cave carved out of the limestone hillside has nothing to offer but solitude and peace, decay and descent for that which no longer lives. Nothing happens in the quiet dark of a cave. Except, that's not quite true. Something is always happening in a cave. A couple of weeks ago, I got to take my two boys to Table Rock Lake for spring break. And on the, way, on the day that we drove home, I decided to stop at Fantastic Caverns, just north of Springfield. We live in the cave state. They hadn't, as of yet, set foot in a cave. I figured it was about time. Anybody been to Fantastic Caverns? A few in the room. America's ride-through cave. It was my second time to go. It is a rather remarkable experience if you haven't been. Kevin, our tour guide and our Jeep driver, was very corny, but also very good at his job. And we learned from him that there is never nothing happening in the cave. There's always something happening. He pointed out where the mushroom garden beds used to be, not too far inside the entrance, an extra source of food growing, particularly during wartime or in the Great Depression. He showed us the water movement and sinkholes leading to even deeper subterranean caverns where salamander and crickets have evolved without eyes to their dark, damp, but peaceful existence. He explained to us how a cave is one giant water filtration system for the earth, absorbing groundwater from heavy rains and cleaning out toxins and contaminants with its limestone sieve, ultimately returning clean water to the open air through the drainage outlet of a freshwater spring. He shone the spotlight on pillars and on curtains, formations sculpted out of sediment, bouncing the light back in radiant beauty, forgotten to us surface dwellers as we go about our busy lives. Something is always happening in the cave. 
The most memorable moment, though, was when Kevin stopped the Jeep midway through the tour. He asked everyone to put away their phones and cover up their smartwatches, and then he turned out the lights. The 20 of us in the Jeep collectively gasped and then hushed. My kids grabbed for each other, and then they grabbed onto me. My eyelids involuntarily stretched open as far as they possibly could, pupils frantically, instinctively searching for some faint speck of light to adhere to. There was nothing. There was plenty of air, but suddenly it felt harder and harder to breathe. The only other place on Earth with total darkness like that of a cave is the bottom of the ocean, Kevin told us. We believed him. Right before he switched the lights back on, my body and my mind had this really eerie sense that we had inched right up to the very edge of existence in that total pitch black eye straining darkness. The edge of existence in a cool, dark, damp cave sounds a lot like where Easter begins. The edge of existence is a place a lot of us have visited, I suspect. We've had some time in our own caves. We may be having some time in our own cave right now. It may be Easter Sunday. Spring is springing. The earth is awakening. You have your alleluia sticks. You're singing the best that you can. You have a lovely meal planned with your friends and family later. You've already snitched some candy from the kids' Easter baskets. I know. But the reality is that maybe you are straining to see, desperate to catch a glimpse of something that you recognize in the darkness around you. You feel close to the edge, the edge of your patience, the edge of your resources, the edge of your sanity. Parents, I'm looking at you. Or the edge of your emotional or maybe even your physical existence. Sometimes we get to that liminal space where we feel like some part of us is dead, and yet we are still walking around very much alive. There are places, there are caves in our lives where we expect to find only dead things. Maybe it's where we've put the dead things of our hearts, relationships that aren't working or are beyond repair, a dream that will never come to pass. A loved one we simply do not want to live without, and yet we have to. Maybe our circumstances have us feeling stuck, immobile towards anything different, or trauma has wounded us so deeply that we've shut down certain parts of ourselves. Perhaps the choices we've made have hurt us or they've hurt someone that we love. Our battles, our behaviors keep us in cycles of defeat. Cynicism drags us toward a deep cavern of despair, or maybe our own actual mortality is staring us in the face and we are finding it harder and harder to breathe. Our bodies have changed, reminding us that they will not last forever. There are caves in our lives. We can be honest about that. We don't want to be in the cave, but sometimes we just are. It is dark, things feel dead. But, Something is always happening in the cave. The last time Jesus was at a cave, not the Easter morning one, was in a town called Bethany, a couple miles away from Jerusalem. He was at the cave that was the tomb of his friend Lazarus. Lazarus had died four days earlier. Jesus knew he was sick, but he didn't get there in time to heal him on purpose. And now Lazarus' sister, Martha, is having some words with Jesus about that, reminding him that he could have done something about this. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. The Jewish people at that time had a theology that included a resurrection, we hear it right there in Martha's words, but it was strictly a future hope, a hope that at the end of days, when this world is over for everyone, the dead would, be, would live again ushered out of their tombs by the Messiah. It had nothing to do with the here and now. Jesus said to her, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, trusts me, will live even though they die. I am. He is. The resurrection wasn't a thing to come. The resurrection was standing right in front of her. The words, I am, as Jesus utters them, echo the very name of God given all the way back in the Old Testament. I am is the identity of God. It functions outside of time and tense. I am is happening now. I am happened in the past. I am will always be happening. Jesus brings resurrection into real life, into real time, into those breathless seconds that passed between them as they stood there on the dusty road discussing Martha's deceased brother. And as Jesus, the resurrection, talked with her, as Mary waited back at the house, as the mourners carried on outside the burial tomb, something was happening in the cave. What was dead did not stay dead. What was past the possibility of resuscitation began to breathe What had passed beyond the realm of hearing stood up and stumbled into the light of day when Jesus called, Lazarus, come out. I am and was and always will be the resurrection and the life. Now, today, four days ago, tomorrow, in years and ages to come, I am. Yes, Jesus is our hope for life from death to come. That is our Easter story, but Jesus is also our hope for life from death right now. He said it before he did it. He was already the resurrection and the life before he himself walked out of the tomb in the darkness of that Easter morning. That morning was no surprise to him. Jesus already knew what could happen in a cave It was the rest of us who needed to see and hear and bear witness to the truth that in Christ, dead things do not stay dead. He is ever and always at work in those caves and tombs of our lives, coaxing what we do not expect to live back into the light of morning. Even when we can't see or feel it happening, Jesus, the resurrection, is at work deep in the quiet darkness. Before our fantastic caverns tour was over, tour guide Kevin pulled the Jeep over one last time. And he shone his spotlight up above where we could see a long, beautiful stalactite stretching down from the ceiling. And every five seconds or so, a drop of water would drip off the end. And then he moved his light directly below to show us where the water landed on top of a stalagmite rising up from the cave floor. Each drop of water leaves trace amounts of sediment behind on top, and then deposits some below. We could easily see how in time, the stalactite and the stalagmite would meet in the middle. One day, future visitors will see a pillar. He asked the kids on the tour to guess how old these formations were, and guesses ranged from three years to 50 years to one million years. Every child thoroughly convinced that their answer was the correct one. And we eagerly awaited to hear the correct answer from Kevin. Nobody knows, he said. Nobody. Not scientists, not geologists, not cave tour guides, not the owner of the property. Nobody. Because no one was here to see when they started growing. And no two stalactites are the same. Everything depends on the conditions around the formation, how much water flows through, how quickly, how much sediment it contains, how cool or warm the cave is. Every cave formation grows at its own pace. The new beauty is birthed slowly and steadily over a long time and by the life-giving water that trickles over it. It took four days for Lazarus, It took three for Jesus. It may take two years to piece back together some fragment of hope after the loss of a friend. It may take 10 to share your story of trauma to help someone else who is suffering. It can be a whole life to overcome addiction. 
Your broken heart may be decades in healing. Your disappointment may take weeks to redeem. The fullness of a resurrected life has all of eternity to unfold. But in Jesus, who is the resurrection, it is always taking shape. Right here, right now. Easter is for us the coming to life of the places that seem dead, in the deep, dark places within us and in the broken, barren corners of the world around us. Something is always happening in the cave, in the tomb, in the ground, in the caverns of our hearts and at the edges of our existence. The resurrection of Jesus wasn't just an event. Resurrection is who Jesus was. Resurrection is who he is. Resurrection and life are who he always will be. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.